I don't know about you, but when I was a kid and I first learned how the birds and the bees were made, I thought it was pretty gross. I was like, <laughs> that's weird, that's disgusting. And I, in fact, I, I don't know how I remember this, but I remember distinctly being in the front yard and being upset or maybe just really annoyed with God because I remember talking to God, thinking to God, and being like, why would you make the process by which we make children be something that nobody actually wants to do? I was just like, that just didn't make any sense to me. Uh, in fact, uh, I have an older brother, and then I have a, me, and then there's my younger brother who's five years uh, younger than us. And I remember when I learned how, how all this operated, I remember hearing phrases when my little brother was born, like he wasn't planned or is it an accident, stuff like that. And so my, I was thinking, well, because this is disgusting and nobody actually wants to do it, something must have happened to my mom. So my parents clearly only did it twice. I mean, obviously only did it twice. And something like crazy must have happened to like her stomach where like there was still possible to have another baby. And then my brother Logan was born, right? And so we have a little miraculous birth in our family as well. And, uh, and so I, I share that because today we're looking again at the birth of Jesus. And this leads us to this question. Is the virgin birth believable? Is the virgin birth actually believable? Now, we are going to conclude this, ser uh, this series this coming Friday at our Christmas service. Uh, this little book called Is Christmas uh, Bel Unbelievable uh, by Rebecca McLaughlin. She ta tackles the same four topics that we are talking about in this sermon series. And we still have a handful of these books left at the teal wall on your way out. The point, we bought these so that they could be all gone. So if you only see, I think we have about 10 left. Don't let that stop you. It's a really short book. It's really easy to read. and really can encourage you in your faith, especially on the intellectual side of things, some of the difficult questions that we look at when it comes to the Christmas story. Now, again, to us, uh, you might be familiar with the virgin birth. And so I just want to say this. If, if the virgin birth sounds unbelievable to you, it's because you have a brain. Okay, that's not something that normally happens. It's, it is something that all of us should be like, I'm not sure that that's actually a thing. Uh, in fact, it, it also would be a, a very big problem for people even in the first century. They knew how babies were made, and they also knew this wasn't a thing. In fact, it took an angel showing up not just to Mary, uh, as we saw in Luke chapter 1, but also to Joseph to convince them that this could actually happen. And so the question for us this morning is, how did this actually happen? And who is this Holy Spirit that could make it happen? And can we actually believe it? That's the question for us. So what I want to do this morning is I want to read from Matthew chapter 1. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. If not, there's a black one in front of you. And of course, if you don't own a Bible, you can take one of those home uh, with you. Now, uh, Luke focuses on Mary's account and really Mary's li lineage and her side of the family. And Matthew focuses on Jesus, or sorry, on Joseph's account and Joseph's side of the family. Now, this makes sense because Matthew's gospel was originally written to a Jewish audience. And so to an ancient culture, everything goes through through the man and the father. And so even though Jesus was technically born of a virgin, legally he would have been Joseph's son. And so all the inheritance, the legal rights, all these sorts of things would be traced through Joseph. And so this is why Matthew focuses in, in on Joseph. Now, Matthew chapter one, the first 17 verses are an abbreviated genealogy of Jesus. How we got here, who Jesus is, some of the people in his family tree. And then it says this in Matthew chapter one, verse 18. It says, the birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together, so before they did the things that people don't actually want to do, uh, that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, divide, decided to divorce her Secretly. Now, this might be a little confusing to you. What do you mean divorce if they're just engaged? Uh, it's real, real quick. It's helpful to know that engagement or betrothal in the ancient world is, was worked much differently uh, than it does for us today. So typically how this would work is you would have the parents of a son and the parents of a daughter, and they would uh, try to find a, someone for their son or their daughter to marry. Now, how this would work is that the, these parents would then kind of arrange this marriage, and they would come to what was known as a prenuptial agreement. Uh, again, in the ancient world, it's very small towns, very are agricultural. And so they would basically say, here's what's going to happen for this marriage to take place. Typically, uh, the, men, the, the, the son's parents would pay a dowry to the, uh, the daughter's parents because in an ancient culture, again, once they became married, she would become part of the husband's family. And so the other family who are losing a daughter would essentially be, be losing a worker or a kind of a child. Now, it doesn't mean that they'd like disown and didn't see each other. It's just that everything that she did and produced from that day forward was a part of her husband's family and not her family that she grew up with. And 
So they would come to a legally binding agreement that could only be broken by the process of divorce. So even though they're not married yet, it's not like today, it's like when you propose, they say yes. Nothing legally happens until the actual wedding day. Legally back then, it would have happened in the beginning of the process as they planned for the marriage. And uh, on top of that, again, those who were trying to follow the Lord, sexual relations would have been considered shameful before you were actually married, even though you were engaged. And so uh, Mary is pregnant. This is a problem, but she's also a virgin, which doesn't make sense. So Joseph, like anyone else, thinks she actually slept with another man, but he wants to divorce her quietly because she wants to show compassion. There are little hints we see in Matthew and in Luke about how Mary and Joseph actually did honor and fear the Lord. They weren't just some like random couple who, like they actually really cared about honoring God. And so he wants to be compassionate to her and not make a big scene. And so he decides to divorce her quietly. But then of course this happens in verse 20. It says, but after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." So Joseph is from the lineage of David, which is what Matthew chapter one, the beginning is trying to show us that he's also from the son of David. Now it's a genealogy. And really the son of David was this idea of the, the messianic hope from Israel. The person who was one day going to come and to rule and to reign would well, be from the kingly line of David. And so the angel is telling uh, Joseph that this Messiah is here and his name should be called. You will name him Jesus because Jesus literally means the deliverer or literally means the one who saves. And so Jesus's name, is coming is exactly what he is coming to do. And then it says this, verse 22. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Now he's referencing the prophet Isaiah when he says this in verse 23. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son. And they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. Now, verse 22 and 23, really quickly, this is a reference to a prophecy that was given in Isaiah chapter 7. Now, I'm not going to read Isaiah chapter 7. It's a whole thing. We actually did this last year, so you can go back in the archives or the podcast if you want to understand more about this prophecy. But, but long story short, what's happening here is Matthew is referencing the prophecy in Isaiah, which came about when Judah, which the capital city Jerusalem is part of Judah, Judah was under an attack or they were under an imminent attack. The king of Israel Ahaz at that time was a very wicked king. And Isaiah is trying to say, hey, if you still trust the Lord, he will deliver you. And, and then he says, here's going to be a sign for you that there was a young woman somewhere at present when this prophecy was originally given who was not yet pregnant that was going to be pregnant and they were going to name her son Emmanuel. And so he said, this is going to be a sign. And so what's happening here, the, the, what, what's happening here is that Isaiah is trying to tell Ahaz that God's promise to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12, that all the nations will be blessed through him will still happen. That Israel will survive. You just have to trust him. He's basically saying God hasn't given up and that if you don't, if you trust in him, you will be redeemed. That's what's happening in Isaiah. It was a real woman that lived at that time. And so what Isaiah, the Isaiah 7 promise, the, re, the reason Matthew is referencing it here, is pointing to the enduring line of David and that therefore Matthew presents the virgin birth of Jesus as the miraculous and total fulfillment of the promise of the, in the person of Jesus. So let me say it this way. I know it might be a little confusing. Uh, and there are many prophecies in the Old Testament that have what we call double fulfillments. In other words, they were fulfilled at that time. And then the New Testament authors later can look back and say how Jesus was the total fulfillment of that thing. And so there was some woman in Isaiah chapter seven who had a child. And now what Matthew is saying that she was, it was pointing them to trust in the Lord. Now the ultimate one who can be trusted above all things is actually here. And so in other words, here's why this is important for us to understand that Jesus's virgin birth, it wasn't just like a really cool thing. Like, it wasn't like, oh, let's just like make say Jesus was born from a virgin because that can add to like the lore of the Christmas story. Like there was real reasons why this was significant. It, in, fact, in fact, not just significant, but even necessary. And one of them is to show that God's ultimate fulfillment to redeem his people has come. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. And so this is one of the, one of the significant things that the, the, the virgin birth shows us is this. And that is that God redeems those who trust in him. God redeems those who trust in him. 
that God is with us. His name is Jesus, but one of the titles that Jesus gets is Emmanuel because God redeems. And so just like the Israelites in ancient Israel were supposed to trust in the Lord, so are we that his Redeemer has actually come. And so the Isaiah 7 reference uh, to the virgin birth offers this, that trust in the sign that God is the one who will redeem, not you or your efforts. And so Christmas for us is a celebration of God's grace, that he has done it, not that we have done it. And this is one of the signs. Now, I don't know what it was like for you, but there there probably are various things in your life, just like there are various things in my life. When I see a sign, I get really excited. So, uh, for example, I remember one time in college, a group of friends and I drove down to the local Krispy Kreme. And um, I was going to say, you know where the red sign turns on? That means like the donuts are like hot now, I think it was what it says. I looked this up last night. I want to say it wrong. I wanted to say hot and ready, but that's Little Caesars. And so when the sign is on, I think it says hot now, and it means that the glazed donuts are being freshly made and come get them. And so we go to Krispy Kreme. The sign wasn't on, and we just went there. And so we, we buy a dozen donuts, and we sit down at the table, and as soon as we sit down, they turn the sign on. And I like, I, <laughs> I wasn't like trying to make anyone feel bad, but I just said, I, I don't know what I said. I was like, really? Or like, that stinks. Like, you got to be, I, I think I said, you got to be kidding me. I think that's what I said. And immediately, as I said, I felt terrible because I knew I said it loud enough that the cashier could hear it. And that wasn't my goal. It was just kind of like, oh man, we just missed it. And so about one minute later, the cashier comes out with a freshly baked dozen donuts. And so it was worth it. And I felt awful because I'm pretty sure she only did that because she thought I was mad. But that's a, that's a sign. Or uh, for me, growing up, I grew up in Cary, and my grandparents live in Statesville, which is a little over two hours from here, and th- their exit was exit 154. And, you know, when you're a kid, you don't really know how, you know, if you're close or not, but when you get close to the exit, it tells you how many miles away. And I think the first time it shows up, it's like says, like, exit 154 is like six miles away. And so whenever I would see that, it's like we're almost there. Or whenever I would we actually get to exit 154 and you take the ramp, it's like we are almost there. The sign uh, got me really excited. And what Matthew is trying to say is that this is one of the signs that shows us that God is coming to redeem us, that we have to trust in the sign, which is Jesus and not our self. And then it says this in verse 24. It says, when Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her but did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. In other words, Jesus' name specifies who he is, that he is our deliverer, and Jesus is giving, uh, given a lot of different titles. And one of his titles, again, from the prophecy, is that what he actually does, and that he saves us, that God saves us. And so another significant thing we see from the virgin birth and the name and the title of Jesus is this, that if Mary was a virgin, that Jesus is both human and divine. What the virgin birth shows us is that if Mary was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus, then it means he actually is human and divine. Of course, as followers of Jesus, this is one of our claims, that he is 100% human and 100% divine. And here's why the virgin birth matters. Because if, if he was not born of a human, if he just kind of like came somehow, you would say, well, that's, you would question his humanity, and rightly so. And so the things that we read about in Scripture, the things that we read about in Hebrews, that God can identify with our weaknesses because he was like us. If he was not born of a human being, we would say how, that, that of course he's not. He doesn't know what it's like because he has not actually been a person. So if he wasn't born of a human, you would question his divinity. But if he wasn't born of a virgin, or sorry, his humanity, if he wasn't born of a virgin, you would question his divinity because his birth story would just be like all of ours. And in fact, you could say it was, he only came because uh, two people decided to make it happen. You need the virgin birth because it makes both of these things significant. It's a sign that we can trust him, that the sign that ultimate savior is here. And it shows us That God, that Jesus comes in the form of a man, he is still 100% God, but yet he can identify with our weaknesses because he is 100% human. And that being said, here's what's significant. So, So there are various implications of the virgin birth, two of the ones that we just said. But the thing about it is, is, as great as those might be, um, if it didn't actually happen, it doesn't matter, right? If Jesus wasn't actually born of a virgin, the the things that we've said so far don't actually matter. Uh, And so for, again, all of us might question, that seems really weird. That probably didn't happen. Of course, why would we believe that this could actually happen? But what's interesting is that this is not the most outlandish uh, miracle or claim in the scriptures, right? In fact, probably the biggest one starts in the very beginning, and it says this in Genesis chapter 1, the first book of the Bible. It says, in the beginning, 
God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths. And the spirit of God, there it is again, the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And so the very first big claim in scriptures in the Bible is that there is one God who created the entire universe. And that God, through the Holy Spirit, created everything we see. So you have God the Father, and you have God the Spirit present in the creation story and present in the birth of Jesus. But if you keep reading a few verses later, it then says this in chapter 1, verse 26. After it's talking about how God created everything, it then says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. Now, of course, the question for many biblical commentators is, who is the us that Genesis is referring to? There's lots of debate. Uh, Many people, especially ancient Jewish sources, uh, argued that this was the the heavenly beings or the heavenly court. Sorry, like angels, these heavenly beings that sat on God's court. And there's various references to this in the Old Testament. Uh, One of the problems with that view is that it says that humans are created in God's image and not the image of angels. And of course, what it shows us is that at the very least that something significant is going on here. And of course, as followers of Jesus, we know that not just the God the Father was present at the creation of the universe and not just God the Spirit, but also God the Son, Jesus himself. So in John chapter 1, John in the New Testament is commenting and writing on the creation account and talking about how Jesus was there. And he says this in John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing that was created, or not one thing was created that has been created. And so if you continue to read John chapter 1, you see that John says that the word here is actually Jesus. And this is what we call the Trinity, that we serve and we worship one God, yet at the same time, he is three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, yet it's one God at the same time, three distinct persons. And it's a confusing thing that our finite human brains certainly cannot fully comprehend. Now, we try to give examples to comprehend it, but they actually fall flat. So maybe if you grew up in church, you might be familiar with some of these. Like They'll say like the Trinity is like an egg, because you have the shell, and then you have the white part, and then you have the yolk, or the Trinity is like H2O because it can be a gas and it can be a liquid like water and it can be a solid like ice. The problem is those were just a little, if you want to put your doctrine hat on just for a second, that's what's called modalism, which is an unorthodox position. And what modalism says is that God is three, but he's three at three distinct times. The problem with water and gas and, and ice, for example, is that in each of those modes, th- that, that thing can only be that thing. It can't be all three at the same time. Or an egg, it's three distinct parts of an egg, but it's not all three at the same time. So there really is no real example that we have that can really express what the Trinity is. That God is one God, but yet three distinct persons at the same time. And the scriptures say that all of them were present at the creation of the universe. And of course, all of them were present when Jesus was placed into the womb of Mary. And so all that to say, again, Rebecca McLaughlin in her book and in her chapter on the virgin birth, she puts it this way. She says, the first outlandish claim is that there is one God who created our entire universe. If this is true, then believing that Jesus was born of a virgin is not irrational. In fact, believing that God could make the whole universe out of nothing, but not believing that he could make one baby without a human father would be irrational. It would be like some, saying to someone, I know you're an Olympic figure skater, but I bet you can't do a figure eight. Right? So the, the virgin birth isn't the big stumbling block. It's actually that God actually created all this to begin with. In fact, what's interesting is the Big Bang is the currently big modern scientific theory of how the universe began. Uh, it, it, you might not know this. It was first pr- pr- proposed by a game na- guy named Georges Latemeyer. I don't know how to say his name. I'm sorry, Georges. You probably don't know I'm talking to you because I'm still saying it wrong. But anyway, he was a Belgian priest. And he was a Christian Belgian priest and also a physics professor in the 1930s. So he was a Christian and he was a phys- physicist. 
Now, his, his original c- conclusion of the Big Bang was interestingly rejected by many, not just because it was a new idea, which new ideas are pretty much always rejected because they're new and we don't like new things, but the primary reason it was rejected it was not that, but because it went against the scientific consensus at the time that the universe had always existed, which of course works a lot better with atheism. In fact, Stephen Hawking, who died a few years ago, was a well-known scientist who was also it was an atheist. He has a book, A Brief History of Time, where he talks about the creation of the universe and all these things from his, our best current understanding. He writes this. He's, as he talks about the, the founding or the understanding of the Big Bang, he says, this was, there was therefore a number of attempts to avoid the conclusion that there had been a Big Bang. Now, now, here's the thing. I'm, I'm not, the problem is what he's saying is that not that it was scientific, but that it rose the problem. That if this has, like, the universe hasn't always existed, somebody had to create it. Now, I'm not trying to convince anyone of the Big Bang. I don't really know what happens. In fact, we know scientifically, historically, we're coming up on about 100 years of the Big Bang being the leading theory. So it would not surprise me at all if in many of our lifetimes, something else supersedes it in the next couple of decades because it is a relatively old theory. What I am trying to say is what Glenn Scrivener puts it this way. He's a pastor. He says this, that Christians believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. Atheists believe in the virgin birth of the universe. Choose your miracle. Now, as I say this, I don't think he was writing this of like a gotcha, like you're so dumb if you don't believe the virgin birth. And that's certainly not what I'm trying to say. What, what he is trying to say is that, here's what he's trying to say, that everyone believes in a miraculous birth. All of us do. All of us do. Either the, the, of the universe, that, that all that we know of came from absolutely nothing, or of a baby. But, but both of these are faith claims. Both of these things do not make logical sense. But we have to choose which one we think is more unlikely. And here's what I have found. Uh, many times it's, it's easy for us to, we'll just say, I'm not really sure how the earth began, but clearly it, it started. It's easy for us to like say that, but not any spend time, any time actually dwelling on it. And the point here is that all of us believe in something miraculous. Do we know that we believe that? And what do we think is actually more likely? And so again, everyone believes in a a miraculous birth. This is not a dunk on atheists or Christians or whatever, but all of us have to understand we are trusting in something miraculous. It's just whether or not we actually think God created it or it came from absolutely nothing. Now, that being said, I want to close by showing, reading these two scriptures. I want to show you how the beginning of Matthew ends and begin, or begins and ends. And so, that Matthew chapter 1, it begins this way. It says, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. In fact, you could actually literally translate it this way, that this is the genealogy or this is the genesis of our deliverer or the one who is with us, right? In Matthew chapter 1, Jesus is presented as our deliverer. And as the one who is with us. And so you could read back into Matthew chapter 1, which, by the way, this is a normal biblical practice, that we are to read it multiple times and meditate and make connections. And so this is a normal thing that biblical readers could do. That Matthew 1.1 1, 1 begins by saying, this is the account of, the, of, the, of our deliverer and the one who is with us. Right? And then how does Matthew 28 end? Well, Matthew 28 ends with what is known as the Great Commission. Jesus is with his disciples and a group of followers before he ascends back into heaven. He tells, people to tell, he tells his disciples to teach people all that I commanded them, to baptize them, and to really show them the way to life and salvation. And the last thing he says this. He says, I am with you always to the end of the age. He begins, Matthew begins by telling us our deliverer who is with us is here. And he ends his gospel by telling us that Jesus will always be with us. In other words, Emmanuel, it means God with us. And it's not just like a feel good title, like, oh, isn't it sweet in this Christmas season to know that God is with us. But it rather, it is a demonstrated action that is actually true and it actually happened. This is the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that God came to be with you and he came for you so that he could redeem you so that you and I could be with him. And that the gospel is not you try really hard or like King Ahaz in Isaiah 7 who rejected the sign, by the way, of, of Isaiah and then things went really poorly. He didn't, he didn't trust the Lord. That for us, it's not about trusting in ourselves and doing all the right things and making sure we never skip church or make sure we always pray or make sure we always give you know, money. It's, that's not about that. That the gospel is that God came into time, the eternal God who has always existed, who created everything we know came into this broken world to redeem those who would trust in the side, to redeem those who would trust in Jesus and not in themselves. 
The gospel is that any and all are welcome, not because of you, but because of him. In other words, here is a final thing for this morning that we can see uh, one of the very significant things about the virgin birth, and it's this. The virgin birth shows us that God's faithfulness to you is not dependent on your faithfulness to him. God's faithfulness to you is not dependent upon your faithfulness to him. Scripture, more than anything else, and it's a lot of things. It teaches us wisdom and who God is, lots of things. But more than anything else, Scripture is about God's plan and story of redemption. It's about God's redemption. It is not about you redeeming yourself. It's not about you trying really hard and never blowing it. It's not about you thinking, well, I did this bad thing, so God must be done with me. No, the virgin birth shows us that he is faithful irregardless or even when we are not faithful to him. It kind of reminds me uh, this, of this. When I was a kid, so I think different people have different experiences with like gifts. I was really fortunate. My parents are, were and are like good gift givers. And so uh, some of you probably didn't have that. And so um, I remember one time, you know, we were telling what our parents would want for Christmas. And this was the year of the Razor scooter. So some of you either know this or some of you were the ones who bought this for your kids. And um, I like, I don't remember, I, my older brother asked for a Razor scooter and I asked for whatever. And about a week before Christmas, like it dawned on me that all my friends asked for Razor scooters. And my older brother, Jordan, asked for a Razor scooter. I was like, I'm, I'm going to be the only one. And there's tons of kids in my neighborhood. And I knew it was too late. Like Amazon didn't exist. Like I, I knew, like my parents had already bought whatever. And so like I was like bummed out. I was like, I'm going to open this Christmas, and it's like, it's going to be a bummer. And so, you know, we open the presents, and we do this thing in our house, which I would recommend to you. Like, everyone doesn't open their present at the same time. You go one by one, which takes it a little bit longer, but it's like, it's more fun. And so we do like the one by one thing, and then it finally, we get to the, there's like one present that me and my older brother both had, and it was the last thing, and we had to open it together. Or we had, we, if we had our own, we had to open them at the same time. And wouldn't he do it? Your boy got a Razor scooter. <laughs> oh, it was amazing. And uh, my ankles probably didn't appreciate it as much, um, but it was, it was awesome. And I know that's like kind of a funny story. What happened there? Like, I didn't ask for it. I, I mean, as a kid, like, you certainly don't do anything to deserve your presence, but it was there. And I know that's a funny story, but I think for us, we need to recognize that this is who our God is, that he did not wait for us to ask for it, that, that he did not wait for us to deserve it, that he did not wait for us to say and do and to behave us, that he came. When we, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, is what Romans says. That while we were far from him, he offered his hand of salvation to us. And so maybe you've been following Jesus for a while, or maybe you have no idea about this Jesus thing. You and I, all of us need to know that God's faithfulness to you is not dependent on your faithfulness to him. That our Father gives good gifts of love and grace and salvation. And the Christmas season is for us a season of hope. And it's not just because it feels cool and it feels good to say that God has come. Well, the Christmas season, why we have so much hope and why we have so much joy is because why God came, what the reason was for it. Not just like to be here and to do some cool miracles and teach us how to love each other, which those things happen. The primary reason he came was to redeem a people for himself. Hey, thanks so much for checking out this video. We upload new videos every week to help encourage you in your faith in Jesus. So be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you'd never miss a thing.